Hello, welcome to yet another session of our NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT World. So we are in the final week of our course on nonlinear adaptive control, and I really hope that you have learned sufficient material to be able to design algorithms that can drive autonomous systems such as what you see in the background. Now, uh, as always, we are interested in all sorts of applications. Uh, of course, what you see here are mostly aeromechanical systems in the background, which is due to my own interest in these. Um, but of course, adaptive control designs are not restricted to these, and uh, you can use it on power networks and biological networks and so on and so forth. Yeah. So I'm always open to hearing more about the sort of applications that uh, you folks are envisioning the use of adaptive control. So uh, what we are looking at uh, in this week, in this final week is uh, the connections with learning. And we are now specifically looking at a, uh, you know, sort of a deep learning problem. Uh, but of course here we are, uh, you know, sort of different in the, the typical, uh, you know, different from the typical learning sort of uh, results in the sense that, we are not doing the learning offline and then implementing it later, but we are doing learning and control simultaneously. Uh, we can do this because essentially this is connected to uh, parameter learning, which we already know very well. From. So uh, that's what we sort of apply. The only difference, or which is of course a significant difference, is that now we have a very nonlinear regressor parameter form, which is not what we uh, we're used to until now, right? We are always assuming linear parameterization and things like that. But you see here that everything is rather non-linear. And so we still have to see uh, how we can deal with this kind of non-linearity. Um, in the previous lecture, of course, we started to, you know, understand some details about um, how my robotic arm dynamics looks because this is the application that uh, we are going to be looking at for application for the use of these neural nets. Um, and we saw the basic Euler Lagrange dynamics, what each term means, what is the joint on the world space coordinates. And um, we also constructed this uh, error variable with respect to a desired arm trajectory. And um, we also, uh, you know, defined this backstepping error type variable, which we have seen before. Uh, and we wrote the dynamics in terms of this backstepping error variable. And in this dynamics now, we have this function f, which is called the nonlinear robot function. And this is the function, as you can imagine, um, we will approximate using our three layer neural network. Okay. So, um, so this is where we were. I'm going to mark our lecture here. It's lecture 12.4. Right. right. So um, now if you look at uh, how we want to design our controller, what we do is uh, we put in an approximation or a estimation of it, and that's called effect. So unlike uh, what you've seen in adaptive control before, we are not approximate, we are not just estimating parameters, but we are now estimating functions. And that's why we have the notion, notation f hat. Okay. And then of course we have a uh, kv times r, which is like a gain matrix, symmetric positive definite gain matrix times this backstepping error variable r. Right? So this is the control. Yeah. So it's called tau zero uh, because we, we designed the control sort of assuming that there is no disturbance, right? We cannot do anything to sort of really cancel the disturbance here. So we just design a control assuming there is none. And this is, you know, you sort of try to cancel this guy with its estimate, you know, just sort of uh, getting motivated from the certainty equivalence type idea. And then we leave this term as it is, say, because uh, honestly, this term is going to cancel out on its own. So we don't worry about this term. Great. 
now so as as we mentioned f hat is an estimate of f by some means which is not yet disclosed so what happens to the closed loop system right so uh so there is this notation it is here so the closed loop system is not km but vm becomes this guy minus kv plus vm times r and plus an f tilde and this tau d and this is where you have uh, sort of this f tilde which is the function estimation so this is just a term zeta naught which is combining these two yeah nothing special about this all right so this is essentially like an error system so yeah, i'm going to highlight this and so this is sort of the error system um and and of course it's driven by the function estimation error right so this f tilde of course shows up here so um so this is sort of like a, i mean although the tau zero seems to have only one term which is kv i mean kvr i mean it has two terms but one of them is to more or less counter the effect of the nonlinear robot function and the other term is what is the like the stabilizing term that we usually inject and this term although it looks like just one term is in fact a proportional derivative type term because of the nature of r so i have a e dot term and an e term and so so this is important to remember right, that it has both a proportional and a derivative type term so a pd type controller is very again something which is very standard in aeromechanical applications even for space stuff pd type controllers are known and found to be stabilizing yeah so in the remain of course in the remainder of the paper we i mean the authors use this equation 14 yeah and we of course uh, focus on tuning this neural network in a smart way so that you can get uh, r to go to zero because you want r to go to zero all right great uh, so why is it i mean one once very quick aside why is it uh, sufficient for r to go to zero i want to quickly to point that out uh, wherever r is defined okay so sufficient for r to go to zero yeah why because this means that e dot plus lambda e equal to some phi function this goes to zero which means e dot is equal to minus lambda e plus phi right and, and what do i know about phi suppose if phi is also bounded we can prove that phi is bounded which means r is bounded if uh, let's see i'll put it uh, properly if r is bounded that is l infinity and r of course goes to zero implies phi is bounded and phi goes to zero right which means that and what do i know i know that this is a stable system right because lambda is positive definite symmetry so this is a stable system with a bounded forcing so we already proved this kind of a result when we did this ortega construction a long time ago that if this e dot plus lambda e type thing goes to zero then e has to go to zero right so this immediately implies that e comma e dot both go to zero as t goes to infinity yeah so it's enough for us to show that r goes to zero right so that's what we aim to do right? so this is essentially uh, like an ortega type construction idea right and even in the ortega construction we did the same thing right great right. um so if you don't remember again i would ask you to go back and refer to the ortega type. all right so that's what it's mentioned here yeah right. so e exhibits stable behavior in fact e is less than r i mean even if you don't have you know i mean of course we are talking about r going to zero in this case that may not happen but even if r remains bounded like right, has some nice uh, bound or or just by virtue of this equation that uh, you know r is e dot plus lambda e then uh, it's it can be shown even without talking about things going to zero because honestly speaking in this article we'll not be able to prove that uh 
anything goes to 0%, but we only prove nice bounded performance because after all, you know, whenever we talk about using neural networks for functions, it's eventually an approximation of the function. So there's always some error. So obviously, if there is some error, um, you cannot expect, uh, just like in case of the disturbance, you cannot expect to for things to converge to zero. Yeah. So the best you will do is get some kind of bounded performance. So just with the relationship between E and R, you can actually conclude that the two norm of E is bounded by the two norm of R. And similarly, the two norm of E dot is also bounded by the square of uh, norm R square, norm R. And so this is uh, important to remember. Okay. Then uh, we also have very standard properties of uh, the robot model. So M is uh, basically positive definite symmetric and therefore it satisfies this kind of an inequality. Right? So you remember that whenever you have positive definite symmetric matrices, you have uh, this kind of an inequality. Yeah. Uh, the second property is that Vm is bounded. Yeah. And by some you know continuous function multiplied by non of All right. This is again a property of the centripetal Coriolis term. Okay. And the uh, the third property, which is a very important property in the Lyapunov analysis, is that the matrix M dot minus twice Vm is skew symmetric. Right. What does it mean? It means that any quadratic form, which is uh, alpha transpose M dot minus two Vm alpha is zero yeah so the uh, so the quadratic form corresponding to any skew symmetric matrix is always zero and so that's what we have in property number three uh, of course we assume that the disturbances are bounded and so norm is missing here but yeah you assume that the disturbances are bounded uh, this property phi we don't use yet i mean we don't talk about it so we, I mean, so we are, which is why there is a psi naught and R. Yeah. That's why you had the psi naught here. Sorry, the zeta naught here. Right. So if you remember uh, the zeta naught that was uh, sort of inserted here. Yeah. The purpose was to talk about passivity. But you remember that we said that we will not discuss the passivity aspects of this article uh, in these series. Yeah, so as of now, we skip it. If we need to, we'll talk about it later. Yeah, right. So this is a property. Yeah, so this is not an assumption. So these are properties. Yeah, so it's not like we are assuming anything. So, of course, this property can also be proved. Uh, with, there's a nice reference that's given for this. All right, excellent, excellent. So now we know that uh, we need only good behavior of the R variable. And we have the dynamics of R given by this equation 14 here. Yeah, which is also something nice. Now, if F tilde was 0 and tau D was 0, then this is well known to be a stable, asymptotically stable system. Yeah. So, if both of these are 0, then you are in very good shape. No problem. Now, the issues happen when this is non-zero. And of course, there is disturbance. So, of course, that uh, also if it's non-zero, then, you know, this is at least bounded. So, you want some bounded performance. So, what you need at the least is that you have a, some nice bound on this F tilde. So, this is the least you want. So, you want a good function approximator. So, that is why you start talking about the neural network control. Yeah, that is where we start discussing the neural network control, right? So, uh, so that's what we say that this nonlinear robot function, if you remember, 11, so that's this guy, yeah, this whole thing, assume that it is uh, given by a neural network as in 3, right? So, it's essentially like a uh, the function fx is replaced by uh, this kind of a weights thing, right? I mean, you, you had it here. And you had it here. Yeah, suppose this function fx is approximated in this manner, where of course epsilon is small enough, and then you have these weights and offsets and so on, and this activation function. So it's like a 
approximated by a three layer neural network. Now, why can we do this? Because we, by this nice theorem 2.1, we have that, uh, you know, a, you can approximate almost any continuous function in this way. Yeah. And fx is, of course, continuous. Right? So, uh, of course, we have this fact that this error is bounded by some constant epsilon n. Right? So, you always need bounds on the errors. Right? If you don't have bounds on the errors, then you can't get bounded performance. Yeah, even with your Lyapunov analysis, right? So of course there is um, results which say that uh, these ideal weights are not necessarily unique. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean that's one cannot expect like um, you know when in standard adaptive control problem, the value of the parameter is sort of fixed and known. For example, if you say the mass of your drone is unknown and you use an adaptive controller, so the mass is a fixed quantity, right? You know what the mass is. Uh, well, you don't know what the mass is, for example, but you know that it is a fixed point. But in this case, that's not necessarily the case because these are not masses and properties of the system, but these are more like weights uh, to some kind of sigmoidal function, which is used to approximate uh, uh, actual nonlinear function. So therefore, the choices are not necessarily unique. Yeah? So we should keep this in mind. So, of course, this according to theorem 2.1, this uh, mild approximation assumption always holds for continuous functions, right? So, uh, right. So, so, anyway, so this is, of course, uh, you know, this is, of course, the important part here. So, then, of course, just for, uh, we define a notation, which is this z equal to w 0 0 v. This is just to make our lives easy in terms of notation, right? Now, uh, before doing any actual neural network type of design, uh, what we want to do is to look at uh, a few different uh, bounding assumptions and facts. Right? Some of them are assumptions, of course, and some of them are facts. That is to say that some of them are guaranteed to hold true and others have to be based on some assumptions. Right? So the first is an assumption. The facts are easy to prove given the assumptions. Yeah. Therefore, we start with the assumptions. The first assumption is that the weights are bounded. Okay, this is a very fair assumption. I mean, if the weights are not bounded, then possibly your function x is not bounded. Function fx is not bounded. Okay, so having bounded weights is a very reasonable assumption. Yeah, good. Uh, the next is that the desired trajectory is also bounded. Yeah. So desired trajectory is defined by QD, but here we talk not just about QD, but about all the derivatives or, or at least two derivatives of QD also. Now this is again no different from the assumption which we made in our previous adaptive control problems. We just said it in words. We said that you have a bounded trajectory with bounded derivatives. Yeah? So here we are making it a little bit more specific. We have taken QD and it's two derivatives. Right? So it's again a very reasonable assumption. You don't want your system to be following trajectories which are too sharp, uh, or too jerky, and so on. So therefore, you uh, do assume that you have a bounded reference with bounded derivatives. So this is again something very reasonable. The important thing here is, of course, that. Uh, and this is a known constant. So you know this value. And similarly here, also you know this constant. So the important thing is that you know these bounds. So, yeah. In case of trajectory, of course, this is not difficult. But in case of weights, uh, knowing a bound is sort of the kind of thing we assumed when we talked about projection in adaptive control. Right. So in this case, we are uh, you know, posteriori assuming that there is a known bound on the weights that we are trying to learn. Then we come to the first fact, which says that for each time t, x is bounded in this way. Yeah. So x is bounded means it's not like a uniform bound or anything, but we know that x contains of, consists of what? x is, uh, okay, sorry. x consists of uh, q, 
well actually i should probably point it out here okay so if you look at this uh, i'm sorry where did we define x yeah right here so the x is defined this way and so x contains what it contains qd and its two derivatives so these we already know are bounded by the cap qd by our assumption and then the error contains uh, e and e dot so these contain what these contain again q and qd dots q and qd and qd dots and q dots right and uh, this is of course bounded by some r along with some qd right so this is not difficult to see right? because that, that you can actually get this sort of a bound on x yeah like a linear bound with respect to a fine bound with respect to r yeah right so now uh, you know we we sort of want to talk about using some kind of taylor series approximations so that we can in fact do uh, deal with these non linear regressor parameter form yeah remember the linearity in the regressor parameter forms is what helps us design most of our adaptive controllers right without that uh we would be in quite a soup yeah so so this is what i mean it is uh, e for extending linear nn to non linear nns right and this requires use of taylor series based results right so this is uh what is important right i mean eventually when we have a uh, non linear regressor parameter form the non linear terms in the neural network we still want to look at some linear versions and we do it by uh taking taylor series approximations of these non linear terms because without the linearity it would be impossible to deal with the structure that comes about and different kind of non linearities that come about and it would be impossible to uh you know get any kind of stabilization results okay. so so we of course as always assume that v hat and w hat are estimates for the ideal weights right um and we of course define the tilde versions for v w and z right and uh, of course we we also have the sort of error in the activation function values this is defined using this notation as sigma applied on v transpose x and sigma applied on v hat transpose x so this is again a notation right so what we uh, want to do is to sort of expand this into uh, expand this with some kind of linear terms right and that's the whole idea right we want to use the taylor series right so taylor series gives us some linear terms right this is standard when we linearize non linear systems also okay great so so what is the taylor series expansion of say this v transpose x we know that v can be written as v tilde plus v cap so uh, we take the v cap as the center sort of and so we have sigma v cap transpose x yeah and then you take the sort of uh, you know you sort of take the derivative with respect to your uh, v cap trans uh, you know this v cap transpose x term so you take the partial or the derivative with respect to x right and that is what is this uh, sigma prime notation right and uh, then you have multiply with the error term which is this v tilde transpose x right and then you have all the second and uh, you know sorry the higher order terms here. okay i'm sorry i think i right we have the higher order terms right here all right great so of course this is defined so this is defined as yeah partial with respect to some sigma prime is defined as you know derivative with respect to some z evaluated at z hat and so on and o z square of course define higher order terms and this is all well known right so of course there are some i mean the authors point to some other reference where a different taylor series was used but that's okay right so now um, of course we the authors want to simplify notation so they call this term as simply sigma hat prime 
why sigma hat prime because the sigma prime evaluated with this hat term so that's the rationale for using this kind of notation and so what do we have we have sigma tilde as uh, sigma minus sigma cap and so sigma we use you know this kind of an expansion here right so what do you have uh, so sigma cap also contains sigma cap is essentially this thing right so whenever i subtract if i subtract these two yeah i just get this term right that is sigma prime we had transpose so let me fix this we had transpose x right and uh, this v tilde transpose x so you get these two terms right here okay and then you have a second order term so this is of course simplified we just call it sigma hat prime and this is v tilde transpose x so this 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 term is just to i mean i'll just mark it so this term is just this whole guy and it's just a shorthand it's nothing other than that okay. so now um there is also the requirement to put some kind of bounds on the higher order terms and so we i mean the authors do do that so this kind of a bound is sort of used and uh, again this is I will transpose, and right? so this is like uh, this kind of a bound. Right? It is. Um, so let me see. I'm trying to see if this is any different from what we have. Different bounds are put on the. Okay, okay, okay. So this term is bounded with uh, again the sigma tilde because this looks like sigma tilde. Yeah, so essentially this, I mean, honestly speaking, uh, this bound is essentially derived from this equation. Right? Because if I take this on one side, I simply have this subtracting this. And this is sigma tilde. This is essentially sigma tilde. And then you have this guy here. Yeah, so this is uh, what you have. So this, if this guy is to be evaluated, then you take this to the other side so you have sigma tilde which is this minus uh this whole thing this whole thing right right so um now in order to get some kind of a reasonable bound for this term uh you use this expression 24 right so you have a fact 4 which is that for sigmoid rbf and tan hyperbolic so all the three activation functions that we looked at you have this to be bounded in this way right and, and uh, these are of course obtained uh, using some kind of bounds on these guys right so this is somehow using that so because you see that these bounds also contain the frobenius norm of v tilde itself right so so these bounds are obtained using this expression right here okay so that's the whole idea okay all right. So of course they also use the, not just the, uh, yeah, they also use the fact that sigma and its derivative are bounded by constants for the RBF sigmoidal and tan hyperbolic. So of course I mean the authors mentioned that the, for nets greater than three, these kind of uh, bounding and uh, these kind of ideas and uh, are are not too difficult to extend either, right? and then it can be done. All right. Excellent, excellent. Great. So, what did we look at in this session is that uh, we had already seen the robot dynamics. So, we saw a little bit more of, uh, you know, sort of how the control structure looks in today's session. We also saw uh, how the nonlinear robot function looks, right? And uh, we understood why R going to zero is sufficient for our purposes. And finally, we uh, once we understood that this f tilde, that is the function approximation error, is what we want to drive as close to zero as possible. Uh, we understood that this is where the neural network comes in. Right. So this neural network is used to approximate this function using this theorem that we looked at earlier. We know that uh, you know we sort of know that uh, this. Um, 
function approximation using neural networks will help us to get close to true value of f. Therefore, f tilde can be uh, made to have like an epsilon n bound, right? And uh, that's what we looked at at how this neural network approximation will work. How we use the Taylor series to sort of linearize the terms in the neural network and bound the nonlinear terms. And this is what we'll use in the subsequent analysis to uh, define these parameter estimation and parameter learning. Uh, and these parameters, of course, the weights of the neural network. And we will uh, hopefully be able to show that uh, you have nice uh, stable performance the way you require. Right? So we'll continue with our discussion in the subsequent session. And I hope to see you again soon. Thank you.